Oh, welcome to uh, the Independent Alliance meeting. Uh, this month we have Jan Lester criticising the eminent um, political philosopher Kim Licker, uh, Canadian political philosopher Kim Licker. And I'll hand it over to you, Dan. Thank you. He wrote the first page. <laughs> <coughs> In his well-known introduction to contemporary political philosophy, Will Kimlicker includes a substantial chapter on libertarianism, plus a preface and introduction that are also relevant to this subject. These are quite likely to help form opinions about libertarianism with many readers. Unfortunately, very many of Kimlicker's assumptions and arguments seem to me to be crucially mistaken. As I have no objection to his way of proceeding and organising his views, I shall respond to Kimlicker's points in the order in which they arise in his text. Uh, consequently, <clears throat> it has proven convenient to divide my reply into sections following Kimlicker's own sections. This should make it easier for anyone to locate and follow Kimlicker's original text and compare it with my responses should they wish to do so. Kimlicker's preface <clears throat> to the second edition. In the preface, Kimlicka says, it is difficult for me to understand why anyone would get involved in a project of political philosophy if they did not think we could make progress. <coughs> I heartily agree with this. In social science and even ideology, progress is surely possible. However, progress is not always as obvious in, as it is in the physical sciences. And even in the physical sciences, errors and dead ends have sometimes been mistaken for progress for a very long time, often decades. Where Kimlicka sees progress in political philosophy, I usually see errors and dead ends. For instance, he says, one theme which I emphasised in the first edition was the way each theory could be seen as trying to interpret what it means for governments to show equal concern and respect to their citizens. Unfortunately, this thematic assumption thereby rules out of consideration things that political philosophy urgently needs to consider, specifically private property anarchism and a libertarianism that is unconcerned with the emotional demand for equal concern and respect. More on these points later. In what follows, I shall be isolating what I take to be the key errors with respect to libertarianism and trying to show that they are indeed errors. Kimlicker often repeats himself, and I've tried to avoid repeating the same criticisms of his points unless an extra tw twist seems to be involved or some emphasis seems to be desirable. We are soon given an example of a key error <clears throat> when we are informed that, to date, there have been three main approaches to defending liberal democracy. Utilitarianism, liberal equality, and libertarianism. Setting aside utilitarianism and liberal equality for the moment, by liberal, equality, by liberal democracy, Kimlicker intends liberal in a modern sense that is only tenuously related to what liberalism originally meant, and democracy as, as some form of what is really elected oligarchy. Consequently, libertarianism is, on the contrary, one of the main approaches criticizing liberal democracy. Why does Kimlicker not see this? As we, as we shall see, he has succumbed to an illusion of fundamental agreement. Kimlicker's introduction. The project. We now turn to the introduction where we are told that our traditional picture of the political landscape views political principles as falling somewhere on a single line stretching from left to right. But then, we are then told people on the left believe in equality and hence endorse some form of socialism, while those on the right believe in freedom and hence endorse some form of free market capitalism. This is at best some version of the modern left-right view. The traditional view originating in France had laissez-faire liberals on the left and state interventionists on the right. It was not a neat and clear division, perhaps, but it is neater and clearer than the muddled modern division that Kimlicker takes to be traditional. He goes on to discuss problems with the left-right division for some ideologies, but he is very happy to call libertarianism right-wing. Kimlicker notes all the various modern theories in political philosophy and suggests that 
To subordinate all other values to one overriding value seems almost fanatical. A successful theory of justice, therefore, will have to accept bits and pieces from most of the existing theories. To think that some form of compromise must be the solution is epistemologically arbitrary. It is also suggestive of the democratic theory of truth. Moreover, it is, in a sense, to subordinate all other values to one overriding value, namely compromise. And so it is itself both fanatical and inconsistent. By analogy, it would be just as arbitrary and inconsistent to suggest that a true scientific theory of some phenomenon will have to accept bits and pieces from most of the existing theories. However, by way of a potential reconciliation, we are offered Dworkin's view that every plausible political theory has the same ultimate value, which is equality in the sense of treating people as equals. Each citizen is entitled to equal concern and respect. <clears throat> this view about concern and respect cannot be right. Concern and respect inherently involve, involve emotions, and they cannot be felt for all and sundry. But liberty can be observed equally, at least in the purely formal sense, that everyone is deemed equally entitled to complete interpersonal liberty. There is to be no imposed hierarchy such that some people inherently count for more than others when it comes to liberty. Does this mean that equality is a more ultimate value than liberty itself? Of course not. The libertarian wants more liberty rather than less, even if it is not spread equally. So equality cannot be the dominant principle. Consider a nutritionist who advocates vitamins as essential for everyone's health. Does that mean he's not really concerned with nutrition or vitamins or health, uh, but because it is good for everyone with equality? Of course not. That would be a similar but more obvious kind of confusion. Kimlicka continues that those on the right believe that equal rights over one's labor and property are a precondition for treating people as equals. Libertarians should not be tempted to agree, for libertarians believe that ideally everyone should have full liberty. Therefore, equal rights are no use if they're not libertarian rights. And equality of liberty is not preferable to a greater total amount of liberty. I shall return to this point. A note on method. In his A Note on Method, Kimlicker tells us that he agrees that, as Robert knows it puts it, moral philosophy sets the background for and boundaries of political philosophy. But he then goes on to state that, we have moral obligations towards each other, some of which are matters of public responsibility, enforced through public institutions. By public, Kimlicker does not mean public in any sense whatsoever as voluntary organisations and institutions, whether profitable or charitable, that anyone might choose to become involved with. He means, as he makes clear, state institutions. In other words, he, he is taking it as an axiom, part of his philosophical method, that there is a moral role for state institutions. <laughs> I don't see how this assumption can possibly be compatible with writing a book introducing political philosophy. Moreover, the word public is hardly a neutral term. Government, state, tax-funded are all objective and neutral, and so seem preferable in a strictly scholarly context. The term public is as biased in favour as the term parasitic is biased against. The fact that the bias is popular political propaganda is no reason for a political philosopher to accept it or promote it. Kim Licker insists that political principles must not crowd out, in theory or practice, our sense of personal responsibility. He quickly goes on to add, it is equally true that any account of our personal obligations must make room for what Rawls calls the very great values applying to political institutions, such as democracy, equality and tolerance. In other words, as a matter of philosophical method, he is again taking it as axiomatic 
that we must have both our sense of personal responsibility and democracy, equality and tolerance. But political axioms are exactly what it is the purpose of political philosophy to examine critically. He even says, I believe that the ultimate test of a theory of justice is that it cohere and help illuminate our considered convictions of justice. <coughs> this is a popular and foolish idea. Why should we look for what can only cohere with our considered convictions? This is only a nice expression for what epistemologically must remain assumptions, biases and prejudices, as I shall explain next. Is that approach even compatible with philosophy? Why should we rule out, before examination, the possibility that a new theory might challenge and overturn some considered conviction so that we learn something new? As my own brief note on method, <clears throat> I should state that I am using Karl Popper's critical rationalist epistemology. This can be explained as follows. Don't worry, it's very brief. All observations are theory-laden assumptions. We cannot perceive reality directly. All arguments rest on, and thereby amount to, assumptions. Logically, we can never support or justify assumptions because of an infinite regress. Therefore, the only logical epistemology is testing and criticism to try to detect false assumptions. To ask a critical rationalist to justify his assertions is analogous with asking an atheist to name the true religion. A critical rationalist can sometimes usefully explain his assertions, but that explanation will itself make assumptions and not, and not be complete. Uh, more on this later. We now turn to the chapter on libertarianism itself. Kimlicke on libertarianism. Uh, diversity of right-wing political theory. We have dealt with the left-right confusion already. Kimlicher's first sentence is, libertarians defend market freedoms and oppose the use of redistributive taxation schemes <coughs> to implement a liberal theory of equality. It would be more accurate to say that libertarians first and foremost defend some version of a non-invasive theory of interpersonal liberty, hence the name libertarianism. If people wish to use their liberty for market transactions, then that is allowed. If they wish to live in a moneyless commune, then that is equally allowed and in no way a lesser liberty. However, people are also at liberty to engage in all manner of non-invasive personal activities such as recreational drug use, consensual sexual behaviour, free speech and freedom of association. These liberties have no particular relation to whether or not they happen to involve markets. And it is quite misleading to fail to give clear and equal prominence to these liberties if attempting to outline libertarianism. Apart from Kimlicher's personal agreement with it, why give special mention to the fact that libertarians oppose the use of redistributive taxation schemes to implement a liberal theory of equality. Libertarians oppose all acts they perceive as interpersonally invasive, whether by governments or individuals. Kim Dicker goes on to state that unlike libertarians, any utilitarian commitment to capitalism is necessarily a contingent one. But why can the same not be true of libertarians? Why would libertarians want capitalism if they thought it were a disaster for either liberty or for welfare? Both possibilities seem conceivable to me. I wouldn't, and I don't know of any libertarians who would. Kim Licker mentions, if, as most economists agree, there are circumstances where the free market is not maximally productive, for instance, cases of natural monopolies, but libertarian economists cannot fairly be overlooked in an introduction to libertarianism. And they would typically not agree that the free market is not maximally productive or that there are natural monopolies, or at least not in any way that one might plausibly hope that politics could improve upon. And it was exactly coming to such consequentialist opinions that led at least some economists and some non-economists to become libertarians. Kimlicker also refers to the possibility of a utilitarian view that 
Redistribution can increase overall utility, even when it decreases productivity. Because of declining marginal utility, those at the bottom gain more from redistribution than those at the top lose, even when redistribution lessens productivity. And again, many libertarians would not agree with this as a realistic possibility because they think it neglects the medium to long-term effects of a system with such systematic interferences in economic calculation. If only the government stopped interfering with the economy, then there would be a compound growth of prosperity that particularly benefited the worst off because of declining marginal utility. And if libertarians did not believe this, then at least some of them would not be or have become libertarians, including me and many libertarians personally known to me. According to Kim Licker, History does not reveal any invariable link between capitalism and civil liberties. Countries with essentially unrestricted capitalism have sometimes have poor, humans right, poor human rights records. For instance, military dictatorships in capitalist Chile or Argentina, <coughs> McCarthyism in the United States. While countries with an extensive uh, welfare state have sometimes had excellent records in defending civil and political rights for instance, Sweden. But if we really have unrestricted capitalism, i.e. a completely free market, then that must mean that people are free to enjoy all the liberties of civil society where markets are involved. And an advanced industrial society has markets involved almost everywhere. It is dubious to suggest that Chile, Argentina, etc. were free markets, as completely free markets, whatever most economies say, ipso facto cannot have taxes or government regulations. It is equally dubious to suggest that Sweden defended civil rights in a way that libertarians would conceive and concede as excellent. What Kimlicker means by what he significantly renames civil and political rights are, rather, what libertarians would see as politically correct privileges and licenses that have nothing to do with liberty. It would take some argument to explain all this in detail, and I have done so elsewhere. The point is that Kim Licker is here offering his audience of inquiring young minds only his stereotypical so-called left-wing worldview, when, in an introduction to contemporary political philosophy, he ought to be providing some unbiased philosophical analysis. He continues his description with the assertion that Libertarianism differs from other right-wing theories in its claim that redistributive taxation is inherently wrong, a violation of people's rights. The more proximate point is that taxation flouts liberty. It is institutionalised extortion. And given that it does flout liberty, the argumentative onus, morally, would appear to be on those who advocate the flouting. But Kim Licker is determined to discuss only rights and the market here, explaining that libertarians hold that government has no right to interfere in the market even in order to increase efficiency. How is this logical possibility of governments increasing efficiency realistic? We are simply not told. The self-ownership argument. Kim Licker particularly criticises Robert Nozick's view on libertarianism and hardly anybody else's and that is typical of many critics of libertarianism I'm afraid. In a single chapter on libertarianism this is probably a mistake because Nozick is ultimately a straw man. Admittedly, unlike most straw men, Nozick did exist. <laughs> He was also a philosopher of note and wrote a famous book on libertarianism. I forget what it's called. <laughs> However, for one thing, Nozick has no explicit theory of liberty and tries to use self-ownership instead, as Kim Licker realises and criticises at some length. Self-ownership? Yes, when you own a cell phone. <laughs> yeah. I think you get them when you put in prison. Yeah. Um, a mobile phone. Yeah. But more significantly still, 
Nozick's approach is viewed by status critics as one of capitalist rights, irrespective of any welfare consequences, and they find this all too easy to reject. So do I, and I'm a private property anarcho-libertarian. Why should anyone accept a system that makes no substantive claim to good welfare consequences and apparently tolerates potentially very bad welfare consequences? By contrast, the classical liberal causality thesis, as uh, I've been legally advised to call it, oh. causality, asserts that liberty explicably and testably systematically promotes welfare. The two big issues that Kimlicker needs to discuss here are, one, what is objectively entailed by the non-invasive interpersonal liberty that libertarians advocate, and two, whether such liberty in practice clashes significantly to its detriment with human welfare or other desiderata. His discussion in this section is irrelevant to either of these and so it would not be very useful for me to reply to it. And the same applies to Kim Licker's criticisms of mutual advantage uh, contractarianism in his next section. So I admit that section completely as well. Libertarianism as liberty. Finally, Kim Licker moves on to a section libertarianism as liberty and it is a relief to read the words some people argue that, that libertarianism is not a theory of equality or mutual advantage rather as the name suggests it is a theory of liberty <laughs> but how could it be anything else as I said to somebody the other day libertarian the clue is in the name. We're all Aryans. <laughs> Cut that bit. <laughs> Surely all libertarians think they're advocating liberty in some sense. However, Kim Licker is not being unfair to state that, taken narrowly, narrowly at least, this is not a plausible interpretation of Nozick's theory. It gives us no purchase on the idea of freedom as something prior to self-ownership from which we might derive self-ownership. The crucial error that Kim Licker now makes is in thinking that liberty must be a founding and overriding value. He writes of liberty being a foundational moral premise. In other words, he thinks that liberty must here be both a supporting or justifying principle and a moral one. On the contrary, it can be held as both a conjectural principle to be criticised in the critical rationalist manner and as value-free insofar as we're not advocating liberty but discussing what it entails. Kim Licker continues, one principle of liberty is that freedom should be maximized in society. And he will argue that this principle is absurd and has no attraction to anyone, including libertarians. Moreover, even if we accept the absurd and unattractive interpretations of the principle of liberty, they will still not defend libertarianism. And this appears to be an admirably bold and clear assertion, if giving a slight impression of bias in an introduction to contemporary political philosophy. His first substantial criticism of this view is that we could increase the amount of freedom in society by increasing the number of people, even if each person's freedom is unchanged. This sort of criticism is relevant to some utilitarians. Some. Utilitarians sometimes advocate utility as such a quantitative end in itself, and so they need to have an answer to this. However, I don't think that there is, this is analogous with what libertarians believe for two reasons. One, libertarians do not advocate as much liberty as possible in the same abstract way, but rather as much liberty as possible for existing people. Language is ambiguous, of course, uh, but that libertarians only intend to refer to existing people ought to be clear enough, and Kim Licker gives no example of any libertarian who says anything different. And I cannot see that the desirability of liberty for existing people is incoherent, or that it logically, logically entails caterist paribus, more people are better from a libertarian viewpoint. Two, however, there is a more important and clinching argument 
based on the fact that liberty, as libertarians conceive it at least, is an absence, while utility is a presence. Utility is a positive state that is additional. My one util and your one util make two utils. Thus, caterus paribus, there is more utility if there are more people. But liberty is not a positive thing. It is about the absence of a bad, namely interpersonal invasions or aggressions or proactive impositions or what have you. Liberty is not about the presence of units of liberty, but, if you like, about the absence of units of invasion. I see no confusion in saying that there is more, more liberty in the world if an existing person escapes some invasion. But there is no more liberty in the world if an extra person is added to the world, even if that person uh, has perfect liberty. The addition of someone with zero proactive impositions leaves liberty on the same total level of infractions. And if, additional, it, and if the additional person does not have perfect liberty, then total liberty will go down. Does this mean that more people is usually worse for liberty? The opposite of Kimlicka's criticism. No, because, as in one, we are not aiming at abstract total liberty, but liberty for those people who exist. Part of the problem here is Kimlicka is proceeding without first philosophically considering, or at least reading about, what libertarians must intend by liberty. That is simply not grasped the libertarian conception of liberty is made plain when he says the principle could also justify unequally distributing liberties. If five people enslave me, there is no reason to assume that the loss of my freedom outweighs the increased freedom of the five slave owners. They may gain more options or choices collectively from the freedom to dispose of my labour than I lose. But the slave owners do not gain any liberty. Liberty is not license. Liberty is being not proactively imposed on by other people, by being made a slave, for instance. License is proactively imposing on other people, by making someone a slave, for instance. It seems doubtful that Kimblicka asked any libertarian what he thought about this criticism. So Kimlicka has not begun to show that libertarianism cannot have a liberty-based theory in the sense of respecting the liberty of e existing people. Kimlicka calls his view a natural interpretation of the claim that, that freedom is the fundamental value. Even if, it, even if it is a natural interpretation, it is irrelevant to a philosophical criticism of libertarianism. He goes on to say that it is encouraged by the libertarians' rhetorical rejection of equality. Libertarians believe in equal rights of self-ownership, but many of them do not want to defend this by appeal to any principle of equality. They try to find a liberty-based reason for equally distributing liberties. I do not see anything merely rhetorical about the libertarian rejection of equality. Libertarians do not need to believe in equal rights of self-ownership or equal equally distributing liberties, though some libertarians might do so. They can simply believe in self-ownership and other liberties, for all, because liberty seems desirable. The conjectured value of liberty is what they appeal to. Equality has nothing in particular to do with it, as explained earlier. Advocating liberty for everyone is on a par with advocating vitamins for everyone. Neither view implies a more fundamental principle of equality. Kimlicka is so obsessed with equality himself that he sees it everywhere. His position is as biased and muddled as a libertarian asserting that egalitarians ultimately appeal to a more fundamental principle of liberty because they want people to enjoy the liberty that equality brings. It might be true that some libertarians say they favour equal liberties but then they are muddled too and I don't defend them. Persisting in his equality error, Kim Licker also supposes that libertarians reject increasing the overall amount of freedom by unequally distributing liberties. He gives no citations for any of these claims. Libertarians believe this, libertarians believe that. No citations at all. He simply says, oh, it pops into his head. Somehow he's got the idea. So, well, 
no, I'm not a libertarian philosopher. I'm not a philosopher. I just write down. Oh, that's yes. Maybe that's true. I don't know why he does that. Why? It's not How? Surprising. How can you not cite a position that you're criticising? You say this is what they all say, and you can't come up with one example of somebody saying it. Uh, anyway, so. on the contrary, given the choice between a world with more liberty lower overall taxation, for instance, and a world with equal liberty, higher but more equal taxation, for instance, a libertarian must clearly prefer the world with more liberty. If any self-styled libertarian were prepared to sacrifice total liberty in order to promote equal liberty, then he would seem to me to be confused in thinking that he was primarily a libertarian. Given that Kimlicker appears keen to refute libertarianism, one might think that he would quote more of what libertarians say about such things. Consistent libertarians are simply not committed to equal liberty for each person, as the ideologically blinkered libertarian insists. They must advocate complete liberty for each person, and failing that, as much total liberty as possible. Therefore, I shall largely ignore as, as irrelevant the theory that Kimlicker calls neutral liberty or the greatest equal liberty principle, that each person is entitled to the most extensive liberty compatible with like liberty for all. However, during this, uh, his discussion, he, in, he attempts to give a non-moralized definition of liberty, and his attempts are relevant. The two views he considers are simply counting up of possible actions or choices, and some assessment of the value or importance of these different opinions, these different options. What do possible actions or choices have to do with the libertarian conception of liberty? Virtually nothing at all. How do they relate to liberty as interpersonal non-invasiveness? They don't. Kimlick has not addressed any actual libertarian theories of liberty. He is attacking straw men. Kimlicker usefully recaps his view with the statement that it is often thought that libertarianism can best be understood and defended in terms of some principle of liberty. Understood, yes. Defended, not necessarily. Libertarianism is exactly about having maximal interpersonal liberty. From a critical rationalist viewpoint, however, how that is defended just depends on the particular criticism it faces, and there is no limit at all on the number or type of criticisms that could be made. Kimlicker's epistemological mistake is in thinking that either liberty itself or something else must be the thing that liberty is defended in terms of. In other words, liberty or something else must be what justifies libertarianism as a foundational moral premise. But as critical rationalism explains, Nothing supports any theory, whether factual or moral. Kim Licker is looking for a mare's nest and complaining that he can't find one. Kim Licker asks, is it true that the free market involves more freedom than the welfare state? And says, in order to assess this claim, we first need to define freedom. About time. We certainly need a theory, or at least some account of freedom, and preferably a libertarian one in the first instance. <laughs> but then Kim Licker replies various accounts of freedom that are not libertarian. He discusses Anthony Flew and says that Flew's equation of capitalism with freedom is rendered problematic, for it is the owners of the resource who are made free to dispose of it, while non-owners are deprived of that freedom. Again, this is a failure of Kimlicker to distinguish liberty from license. We do not deprive would-be thieves of a freedom in any libertarian sense when we lock our doors. Of course, there might well be something wrong with the libertarian sense or even contested senses of liberty or freedom. But why does Kimlicker not criticise them? Because he has not troubled himself to find out what they are. He thinks he can sort it all out a priori is completely mistaken. He defends his zero-sum view of freedom 
by reference to the origin of private property, concluding that since private ownership by one person presupposes non-ownership by others, the free market restricts as well as creates liberties, just as welfare state redistribution both creates and restricts liberties. But the libertarian issue is whether some example of private ownership minimises any proactive impositions, i.e. initiated invasions, interferences or restrictions. And if it does, then that is the libertarian option. And that is what allowing initial acquisition and the free market does do, and what the welfare state does not do. Though we always have the pre-propertarian principle of interpersonal liberty to fall back on if there are any problem cases. Of course, I don't expect this necessarily brief account to be enough to persuade Kimlicker, or even to be fully clear to him. But I have written at length about it elsewhere, not least in Escape from Leviathan, now available in paperback for only £15 at all good Amazons. And that account refutes the faux sophisticated conclusions of G.A. Cohen, which Kimlicker quotes with approval that private property is a distribution of freedom and unfreedom, and that the sentence free enterprise constitutes economic liberty is demonstrably false. Consequently, Kimlicker is wrong on two crucial accounts when he concludes that the system of exchanges which knows it protects itself requires continuous interference in people's lives. It is only continuous state intervention that prevents people from violating Nozick's principles of justice. He is wrong first because it is not a proactive or initiated imposition or interference or invasion or aggression or restriction to defend exchanges that do not themselves proactively impose. And second, because continuous state intervention is the primary source of violating Nozick's principles of justice, <coughs> i.e. liberty, albeit inadequately theorised via self-ownership in Nozick. Free market property protection would, would not have this continuous interference because, because it would offer continuous defence. Which point leads us into one of Kimlicher's biggest and clearest errors. <coughs> Kimlicker argues, since property rights entail legal restrictions on individual freedom, anyone like Flu, he misspells his first name by the way, who claims to oppose any social or legal constraints on individual freedom should presumably reject state-enforced property rights and endorse anarchism instead. But libertarians are not anarchists. They strongly believe that the state should impose constraints on individual freedom and uphold property rights. That was all in bunny quotes. As we have seen, property rights do not, ipso facto, entail legal restrictions on individual freedom in the libertarian sense, because they promote freedom when they do not proactively impose or when they minimise proactive impositions. But the howling error here is asserting that libertarians are not anarchists. On the contrary, many of the best-known libertarians are anarchists. How could Kimlicker not know this? The only book by Murray Rothbard in Kimlicker's bibliography is The Ethics of Liberty. But in that book, Rothbard's anarchism is made very plain, particularly in his criticism of Nozick in Chapter 29, Robert Nozick and the Immaculate Conception of the State. That chapter even concludes with the following sentence. Thus, the most important attempt in this century to rebut anarchism and to justify the state fails totally and in each of its parts. Kimlicker continues. Most libertarians do not claim that the free market creates more freedom than it takes away. They argue with flu that it does not create any unfreedom at all. That is more or less right. He asks, how can libertarians say this? The answer is that they have shifted to a moral definition of freedom, which defines freedom in terms of the exercise of one's rights. No, that is not the correct answer at all. 
though doubtless some self-described libertarians might well give it. Property rights are an objective way of minimising proactive impositions or maximising liberty, and it is an entirely separate matter whether this is moral or not. Kim Licker continues his attacks on the enemy army of straw men. At one point, Kim Licker says, having independent access to resources is important for our purposes and hence our purposive freedom and that argues for liberal equality, not libertarianism. But, say libertarians, the state does not increase our independent access to resources. Instead, it destroys our resources by its bottomless pit of wastefulness and makes people increasingly dependent on a capricious and intrusive Leviathan state. Of course, the libertarian view is controversial. And I do not have the space to explain and defend it in detail here. My point is that Kimlicher is putting forward his own controversial statist view as an obvious fact in a book that purports to be an introduction to contemporary political philosophy. In the final paragraph of Libertarianism as Liberty, Kimlicher states that there is no philosophical and political problem of freedom as such, only the real problem of assessing specific freedoms. On the contrary, as we have seen, there is something important that libertarians mean by liberty, and Kim Licker simply has not begun to grasp what it is. He says, whenever someone says that we should have more freedom, we must ask, who ought to be more free to do what, and from what obstacle? And the clear libertarian answer is everyone ought to be more free, i.e. not proactively imposed on, to do whatever they happen to want to do without proactively imposing, which is not part of liberty but license, primarily from the obstacle that is the proactive imp impositions of the state. He continues, whenever someone tries to defend the free market or anything else on the grounds of freedom, we must demand that they specify which people are free to do which sorts of acts. Everyone is free to do whatever sorts of acts do not pro proactively impose on others and then ask why those people have a legitimate claim to those liberties. It is an unrefuted conjecture that such complete liberty is desirable, i.e. which interests are promoted by those liberties. The desirability of liberty is a conjecture that is not based on promoting any interests or anything else. And which account of equality or mutual advantage tells us that we ought to attend to those interests in that way. No account, neither equality nor mutual advantage is the conjectured desideratum, liberty itself is. Kimlicher concludes that we cannot preempt these specific disputes by appealing to any principle or category of freedom as such. Liberty as a conjectured ideology invites disputes. It is Kimlicher who cannot preempt his possibili this possibility by appealing, as he does, to justificationist epistemology and non-libertarian views of liberty. Five, the politics of libertarianism. And so we reach the final section on the politics of libertarianism. In a typical example of bias, Kimlicher writes, that libertarianism rejects the principle of rectifying unequal circumstances. Why rectify? Why put it as an apparent fact in this introduction to contemporary political philosophy that libertarianism refuses to put something right that has manifestly gone wrong? Libertarians are more likely to see it as refusing to lower liberty and welfare on the basis of some unsound theory of in invasive equality. He continues, taken to the ex extreme, this is not only intuitively unacceptable, uh, even where true arguments can show intuitions to be mistaken, but self-defeating as well, for the failure to rectify disadvantageous circumstances can undermine the very values, for instance self-determination, that the principle of respect for choices is intended to promote. There is no vague principle of respect for choices in libertarianism. There is only the principle of liberty. 
We should not even say respect for choices that do not proactively impose on other people. Because it is not about respect, but toleration. And toleration of anything that does not proactively impose, not just choices. Moreover, there are no values that libertarianism is intended to promote. This is simply justificationist confusion. But in any case, libertarianism cannot undermine people's self-determination. If someone is not being proactively imposed on by anyone else, then his self-determination is not being interfered with, and so it cannot be undermined. Kimlicher's moral excoriation continues. The libertarian denial that undeserved inequalities in circumstances gives, give rise to moral claims suggests a failure to recognise the profound consequences of such differences for people's capacity for choices, agency and dignity. To which a libertarian might reply, on the contrary, people have no impaired capacity for choices, agency and dignity with a flourishing libertarian society. It is both being robbed by and becoming dependent on the paternalistic welfare state that has taken away people's real choices, agency and dignity. The egalitarian view that inequalities in circumstances give rise to enforceable redistributive claims demonstrates a complete failure to recognise the profound consequences of such a policy for all people in terms of the undermining of their liberty and welfare. This is not, as Kim Dicker supposes, a slippery slope argument which draws attention to the ever-increasing costs of trying to meet the principle of uh, equalising circumstances. It is an argument about the immediate loss of liberty and welfare, and then this loss increasing at a compound rate. It is not viewing the popular conception of equality of opportunity as unstable. It is viewing it as, an, as impossible to realise and undesirable as a goal, even to begin to approach. Kimlicker gives what he regards as an unproblematic example of what is desirable here. The attempt to equalise educational facilities, for instance, to ensure that state schools in predominantly black neighbourhoods are as good as predominantly white schools, does not impinge in an oppressive way on individual choice. Equality is, as usual, a red herring here. The provision of state schools impinges in the first instance on the choices of the individual taxpayers to spend their money as they wish. But the dire state schooling also impinges on all the children who are subjected to it. This is because an efficient, thriving market in child education has been crowded out by right-wing paternalists like Kimlicker. He goes on to discuss more difficult issues with realizing, without realising that his unproblematic example is completely flawed. Is it true that it is inhumane to deny that unequal circumstances can create unfairness. Our moral intuitions, including fairness, probably evolved and were useful for survival when humans lived in small groups of close relatives. Understanding the fairness have now even been displayed among other animals, such as monkeys. This suggests that fairness has survival value for within families or among close relatives or friends. However, there is no reason to think that this moral intuition can practically be applied to a wider society. To do so is to impose redistributive policies, uh, and to do so and to impose redistributive policies on that basis is to assume that a whole society's circumstances can be equalised or compensated for without significantly reducing liberty or welfare. But that assumption is erroneous because such imposed redistribution both restrict non-invasive liberty and disrupt the economic calculation and capital, capital accumulation that an advanced economy requires. Kim Dicker admits that a lot of opposition to the welfare state is due to the fact that it is perceived to have failed. But he thinks that this has very little to do with libertarianism in the philosophical sense. Not many people have even heard of libertarianism, of course, or not until Ron Paul, at least. 
But state failure is evidence that libertarians cite in recruiting new libertarians. And a move away from the state is a move towards libertarianism, whether philosophical or not. We are told citizens in Western democracies have not en masse rejected the principles of liberal equality. But it is not likely that state subjects embrace the principles of liberal equality in any philosophical sense either. Do people en masse, rather than most ideologues, even have a vague approval of liberal equality? Would they even be able to say what those words meant if asked? Most people don't think much about political principles as they know it wastes their time. Kimlicker is right to say that the debate between right-wing and left-wing parties is not over the principle of protecting the vulnerable. That is not disputed by either side. But that is because both sides have the same paternalistic right-wing principle. We are then informed that, unfortunately, the perceived failings of the welfare state have not only contributed to a dissatisfaction with traditional redistributive policies, but have also generated widespread distrust of the government's capacity to actually achieve social justice. Unfortunately, fortunately, more people are now not only distrusting the government to achieve social justice, but are also beginning to trust the market to achieve it. Fortunately, the scales are falling from people's eyes, but not Kim Lickers. He lists a number of so-called left-wing and right-wing positions, which I shall omit. He asserts that none of the right-wing positions appeals to libertarian principles. However, from the perspective of critical rationalism, there are and can be no foundational libertarian principles. There is only the conjecture that non-invasive -inter non interpersonal liberty is preferable to state intervention. And consequently, all these so-called right-wing positions are fully compatible with libertarianism. The manifest growth of self-perceived libertarian organisations in the UK and the US also refutes the idea that there has been no ideological movement towards libertarianism. The fact that political parties share some fundamental paternalistic principle does not gainsay this. Therefore, Kim Licker is completely deluded in thinking that libertarianism is a non-starter. This delusion mainly exists because he does not really understand libertarianism. <coughs> Conclusion. Kimlicker clearly wishes to refute libertarianism. But if one wishes to refute a theory, it is first necessary to understand it. And one then needs to criticise it in its strongest form or forms. There are undoubtedly some forms of libertarianism that can be described using various combinations of the following positions. They do not have a proper theory of non-invasive interpersonal liberty. They make an inevitably futile attempt to justify libertarianism by some means. They conflate what liberty is with why liberty is desirable. They are not particularly concerned with the welfare consequences of the ideology. They assume a state of some size. And for many of such kinds of libertarianism, some of Kim Lucas' criticisms might well be sufficient to refute them. However, many libertarians would also regard all those forms of libertarianism as hopelessly faulty and would happily criticise them themselves. This is because they prefer what can instead be described using various combinations of the following positions. They do have a proper theory of non-invasive interpersonal liberty. They do not attempt the epistemologically impossible justification of libertarianism by any method, but seek and answer criticisms of the libertarian conjecture. They clearly distinguish what liberty is and, and objectively entails from whether liberty is valuable or moral. They are particularly concerned with the welfare consequences of the ideology. They are anarchists. And for many of such kinds of libertarianism, Kimlicker's criticisms are insufficient to refute them. And for a libertarian theory that is all of these, Kimlicker has so far 
not even attempted one criticism of it. Thank you. Any questions? Is there anything good in the book apart from the unintentional humour? <coughs> unintentional humour should never be undervalued. No, I don't know. Does he make observations that you think are actually worthwhile? So, <coughs> he um, analyses. Uh, certain uh, philosophical positions in political philosophy in a way which is interesting and is and goes a lot, uh, is how a lot of people think. Somebody said recently in a, in something I was reading that the, that Robert uh, sorry that um, Rothbard was just hopeless and not worth reading and I just thought this is absurd. I mean, Rothbard is always worth reading. It, 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 uh, even when he's completely wrong, he's very stimulating. And often, uh, if, if he's only slightly wrong, and you know, but uh, even if somebody's completely and utterly wrong, that doesn't mean they're not worth reading because you can you can you read them and you can see why they're saying what they say. You have a response to it, and it really informs you and fills in the background to the debate. In that sense, um, I think the book is worth reading because oh, if if only because an awful lot of other people are reading this, and if you want to know how they think, and they they did, I don't know. Political Philosophy 101, and Kim Licker was the set book. If you haven't read this book, you, you'll have take, it'll take you longer to get to grips with what they're saying. So, uh, but there are a few insights, yes. I mean, he says, these people think that, and they probably do so for these reasons, and you think, yes, yeah, probably they do. Um, yeah. Um, I suppose I'm a bit more specialised these days, and I'm not... I don't really want to get the, to the bottom of some of these other theories, and uh, Kim Licker is something of a generalist. He's quite happy to want to come up with the most plausible theory of feminism and liberal equality and, and everything else, um, and, but, uh, but apparently not libertarianism, which, I say, for him and for many, many people, just is Nozick. Nozick is libertarianism, that's it. Uh, this has been ever since the book came out. Uh, people say, "I'll tell you what's wrong with libertarianism," and then they say something against Nozick. And uh, is that an advance or not? What is what? Is what is what an advance? I mean, compared to what had Nozick not written? Oh, I mean, uh, he, 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 Nozick helped get libertarianism noticed. I'm not objecting, but uh, it's just uh, it, Nozick is a bit like uh, Ayn Rand. Uh, a no, very good place to start, no, yes. <laughs> but, a, but a terrible place to finish. Yes. Uh, okay, slightly, slightly better than Ayn Rand. But right. <laughs> well, two quick points. When I was a boy, actually, when I was a boy, I didn't read this stuff. But still, when I was a boy, an old boy, um, introductions consisted mostly of um, quotations and selections from other writers. I didn't try and sum them up. I let them say something. Well. He doesn't do this plainly. We're sort sort of the opposite, really. We're quiet. Uh, and um, second one is more technical. Um, you speak of total, total liberty. You sound dangerously close to something that has to be aggregated and uh, calculated, and it consists of um, libertils. So many libertils are lost. So many libertils are gained. Mm. But I should answer a question for you. I think by saying no, any state of affairs that includes any illiberality, if some element of that is removed, total liberty is increased. Yeah. That would be, mm, mm. but it's not measured in yeah. anything particular. It's one of the many, many ideas where he 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 th th works out what he thinks libertarians must think, and then says, Phew, "Well, that's ridiculous." That's because he um, thought it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm sure that it's not peculiar to libertarianism. I mean, a lot of people uh, criticise socialism who just don't really understand the particular socialist theory that they're purporting to refute, as you may have, must have experienced with Marx. They have no idea that, 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 that socialism's got nothing to do with this thing that they say, but, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Worth reading. I think it's worth reading. Is it thick? Is it expensive? Uh, it, it's... Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's fairly thick. It's about 500 pages or so, and... Um, not, 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 not very expensive. You get a second-hand copy. 
Uh, well, he covers the waterfront. He does. The that's it. Yeah, I mean, if you want to know where all, the, just all of these different theories, he tells you about them. Um, well, I mean, I, I I say that I think that he has insights into the other theories, but it could be that everybody else said no. God, <laughs> he doesn't understand feminism. He doesn't understand them. Could be that in everybody's speciality, they they're equally appalled by what he's written. I I don't know. Is um, there a good book list? That can be dignified. Uh Well, in the bibliography. Yeah. Mm, well, I said one book by Rothbard. Oh. Uh, and and uh, very almost no libertarian economics, and it, so libertarianism without the economics is is. is I mean, he argues that libertarianism is all about free markets, and then he sort of ignores the economics completely. But it's, well, if it's about free, free market, you think the economics would be relevant, and what about the libertarian econ- economists? I mean, surely they must be relevant. No. So there's no no. No, no discussion. No, in, the, in the text, it's it's. Knows it can Anthony flew pretty much, and that's it. I mean, and uh, Anthony flew. I mean, if somebody said, "Give me a give me a list," give, you know, tell me twenty libertarians. Well, I don't think I'll put lib- flu in the t- twenty fifty. No, two hundred. Yeah, yeah. We, 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 you get long enough. I'd put the, and they, but then I'd sort of with qualifications. I'm surprised when you were talking about his his de- definitions issues about liberty that um, he talked about his talk about equality. Do you think I'm again having to guess what his thought processes are? But then he's been guessing about the last five years. Yeah. Well, we paid a compliment. But do you think he when he was what his views about he, and you know when, when, was it? Um, um, Oh, Spencer's idea of equality. Yes, I mean, there is, that idea exists. Do you think yeah. he's misinterpreted that? Or he's heard, heard the expression? I think, no, I, I think he's almost certainly heard the This doesn't appear in the text. He's come across the idea. And as soon as you said that, I thought maybe he's read... Yeah, read no, I think he might well have done, but he doesn't, he doesn't cite Spencer in the text. Um, I can't remember whether he's in the period of all three, but I don't think he is. Uh, but I, I, I could just couldn't swear to that. But yeah, I mean, it's a it's a it's a popular view, and I've heard it defended by some people. Because you uh, talk about the the, 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 the ignorance of the anarchist position, mm. or at least the red scene in the in the English. I mean, is there no? no way well, he says there, there are the libertarians are anarchists. They, he said, they, you know, why aren't they? Uh, it's, that's a, so he definitely thinks they aren't. Some for some reason he's he's read. Rothbard's book and not noticed that the man is an anarchist. He's not read his spoon out. Well, when I say he's read it, I should say it's in his bibliography, uh, which is not quite the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Does, he doesn't, sorry. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah, I read um, my book back from like 25 years ago when I was a student myself and wrote an essay, or several essays, I think, criticising this chapter on the materials. I think I got most of the points in the race. Um, <laughs> you could have saved my time if you kept those essays. I said, I'll have to go back and read, read my essays yes. uh, to see how many of them are in there. But one thing that I don't remember was the, the, the straw men. It, it was a relentless series of straw men. Mm. It, was it was clear that the only libertarian he, he'd actually bothered to read, even halfway copy of Robert Menzik. Yeah. Uh, and it was absolutely obvious that even though he cited Rothbard, he clearly hadn't read him at all. Uh, it's not just that he didn't know anything about anarchists. It, he, was, he wasn't even familiar with Rothbard's criticisms of Nozick and, um, mm. um, and, and, the idea, and, and, and those, those silly ideas about uh, libertarians as liberty being absurd because we want more people in the world. It's just idiotic arguments. I think I probably covered it in there. Uh, but it's, uh, the, trouble with it, the trouble with him is, is that he's just, um, he's not... Uh, it's just he's not he's not interested in libertarianism. He thinks he ought to be. He, he wants to refute this. He can't be bothered to learn anything about it. He thinks it's it's, it's also obvious, also obviously wrong. It's just, it's just well, a simple matter. Yes, it's so glib. Well, it's, 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 it's just it's a simple matter of drawing out one or two. Well, when you it's a bit like witches. When you know witches are evil. Philosophy, you know, and that will yeah. Be. When you know witches are evil, you don't want to yeah. uh, learn about their secret yeah. practices. You just <laughs> want to burn them. And so. Refuting them, but without getting your hands dirty. That, that, that 
being said, then, is that th th there are lots, as you pointed out, there are lots of libertarians who make all of these errors. Yeah. And, um, yeah, the, the, I had to concede. In the end, I had to concede yeah. that, that. Yeah, he. I mean, he, Rod, Rod, yeah. Rod Long goes around making these errors all the time. He's constantly babbling on about equality, and uh, I mean, he probably gives a better account of it than. Uh, mm. Yeah, he, he, Rod Long's a defence of libertarianism and equality. It's probably more sophisticated than Kim Kim could imagine, but Rod Long does that all the time. Uh, political correctness is a wash in what passes for a lot of modern libertarian thinking. You know, you just. Riveting in political correctness. Uh, yeah, it's, you know, the Cato Institute churns this stuff out all the time, you know, so it's, you can see why you know, mm -hmm. he thinks that these put to be correct attacks on libertarianism will do, because so many libertarians are in fact in political correctness and um, they need to be purged, you know, obviously. <laughs> not, not, bod not, bod not, bod not bodily, uh, obviously, <laughs> but ideologically, you know. Our, our good friend John, uh, Tom, Tom, Tom Burroughs here, and it's occasional, yeah, occasionally on his Thomas Dutter writings, just wander over to political correctness and shake his hand from time to time, <laughs> rather upsettingly, and uh, needs to correct his ways on that sort of thing, but it, but it happens, it happens, it happens a lot, so, you know, a lot of the things. Yeah. Well, but not, not everybody's as consistent as, uh, as we are. But nothing. <laughs> Nozick mentions uh, libertarian anarchists, doesn't he? Well, it's he in, mentions Rothbard, for example. It's in the, it's in the title. Yeah. It's in the title, and he mentioned him in the text. Yes, Rothbard. Yes. But, I mean, oh no, I mean, he tries to refute. No, that's it. He, he tries to refute Rothbard. I mean, that, yes. that always, that's the whole point is he's trying to refute Rothbard, and uh, and he, so, so, you th so he's read he's read Anarchy State Utopia with um, Nozick trying to refute Rothbard, and he didn't notice that. What what knows he's trying to refute is Rothbard's anarchism, in other words, libertarian anarchism, and it's yeah, it's 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 a glaring blind spot. How can you not notice that? I'm a rock, especially if you're writing a book about it. Yes, mm. uh, you'd think you'd check. It's mostly because anarchism is on the left, therefore it can't be anarchism. Uh, oh, I think actually uh, another theory. I didn't bother burdening you with my footnotes, but. Um, uh, this has been accepted, by the way, by libertarian papers in this current form, unless you have any criticisms that make me want to change it. Not um, yes, uh, is, uh, he might be confusing anarchy with anomie, which is no law and no rules, which many people do. They say, oh, you're an anarchist, so you don't believe in law. I mean, that's a sort of common sense. Thing. Uh, I, 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 it's a bit like a lot of people, you know, they, it's, it's just a lazy, it's like this kind of conflation between liberty and licence, maybe, or doesn't it? So you're an anarchist then? So you were with the riots last August, were you? You were one of them. That, uh, that, yeah, it's. That's, you know, that's, that's particularly when, when I suppose some, some anarchists might, maybe it's the touch of irony, as within certain groups, you know, pick the irony, where they'll actually wear, like, you know, you know you get, you've got people wearing, like, smash the state t shirts. But they might have like, you know, a Mises Institute tag at the bottom that people don't see that, it's not that they oh, pick up on that, you know. And they, they assume it's the same as somebody throwing rocks at a window, including private property, without any interest in yeah. that, and that, that's the problem. But then I suppose that's the problem we're always going to get, when people are picking off on certain mm. vibes in order to advance that mm. point of view. But then if, you, if you're hostile to libertarianism in the first place, it's as far as he is, then a lot of these kind of points are just going to get, not going to get through. So. Yeah. Oh, he is. He is really hostile. But, um, uh, I mean, when I first read this, of uh, course, I read the first edition when it came out and didn't think much of it. Uh, and I and sort of re looked at it recently and I thought, oh, I suppose I ought to reply to this. And at first I thought, you know, this is just so horribly, horribly wrong headed and confused. Is it, should we even dignify it with the reply? And, and after a while I thought, no, 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 this, is, this guy has done us a real favour. I mean, but, and I'll tell you why I realise he'd done us a favour, because I, I, I thought, what I thought it, I'd do is, I thought I might write a book by refuting all the misconceptions of libertarianism in introductions to philosophy. There is only Kim Lickers. Only Kim Licker? I couldn't find any others. They, I, I seem to remember it was once in Mulhall and Swift, a book, uh, uh, there was a chapter on the bit, but, I, but now I couldn't find it. So I thought, okay, 
get 10 introductions to philosophy, look up the section on libertarianism and say, what's wrong with it? No, only Kim Lick has done it. So he's done us a real favour. He's putting us on the map. He's putting us on the map and, and um, sort of setting himself up as a target so that you could easily, easy, easy to knock down. I, uh, if, if he hadn't written this book, I would have paid him to write that chapter. You know, in just the way he'd written it, because it's that it's it's so valuable that that, that yeah. he's done it rather as than Oscar Wilde said, there is nothing worse than being talked about, and there's not being talked about. So. Yes, <laughs> but that, that, that's the question I want to ask. I mean, the Kimberley obviously is it comes from a fairly stable discourse within political philosophy, justice, equality, and the usual concepts mm. that you get from these people. Mm. If for some reason he does choose liberty, libertarianism, as a community with which to address and uh, demonstrate that it should not be this, this dangerous panacea to mm. ideas that students could come across and effectively start to uh, think about. I mean, yeah. at the end of the day, it is, it is essentially to, to make sure that students don't think about liberty or libertarianism because you supply them with the answers before. Well, I, no, no, is, that is I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, he's trying to inoculate them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it, you know the best-selling um, uh, book in 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 Germany that, that on on Amazon when Amazon started was uh, Mein Kampf, which was because it was banned, mm. uh, and, and I think that because it was banned, it was the best-selling book. So so if you keep say to your students, whatever you do, don't become this is the really the, this is the worst. You know, you, you're filling their heads full of ideas about libertarianism. Uh, as soon as they meet a libertarian, they've got theories. They're going to go head to head in an argument, and they're going to learn. It's oh, maybe it's not quite like I was taught. No. The, the, the point is to me, you have you have a philosophical discourse which is so confident it doesn't think its proponents don't think it even needs to address it at all. You know, they just they just sweep on by and we left in the labour. If Kimmler, for some reason, does do that. Oh, it's because he's Canadian. Uh, uh, No, seriously, Canadians are some of the most politically correct bar stewards I've ever come across. They are appalling when you meet them and you think, oh God, I thought I'd seen political correctness before, but the Canadians are the worst. And, it, and because they that, that they hate us so much, they re, they they for, to us, we're the real enemy. Libertarians are the real enemy, and that's why they love. Because with the noble exception of Jan Narvison, uh, how he what, did he start in America or something? And he moved to Canada. I'm not sure how that happened. But how is he more conservative? Well, yes, because we are sort, we've got a sort of theoretical. Um, Background that you know conservatism can be dismissed as as uh, you know unthinking. Well, I know they can't do that. But do you think that there's thinking about one or two other examples of where people have laid out the sort of the terrain of political philosophy, if not for for the young students, then maybe just as sort of another tutorial of what's going on. How you sort of one of the introduction books. Remember, I was like Plato said to you a few maybe a couple of years ago now that when Roger Scruton brought out his dictionary of political thought. Mm. that he sort of felt that he needed to do a response because he, he yeah. was baking a lot of his own prejudices into... His own the, ideas were in the dictionary. Saying, now, actually, I've actually still got an increasingly yellow and graphic copy of it. Sort of. Me too. I um, but the glue is terrible in that paper yeah, bag edition, it's, 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 it's all kind of pieces. Uh, but what I did notice is that reading it again, I actually thought, actually, you know what? It's still pretty fair most of the time. There are some egregious yeah. shockers in there. But generally speaking, when he's describing, you know, classical liberalism or... You know, sort of it, oh, he's not, well, he's not, he's he's not as bad as Kim Licker. He's not. No, he's, you, you, if, you, if you read it, you think, yeah, that's a little bit cheap, but generally speaking, you're quite right. Yeah, it's not too bad. I agree. Yeah. Um, I don't think the, the idea of equality should be abandoned entirely. I'm not sure you are abandoning it, but um, or at least mm. sniffed at it. I think it's for propaganda purposes and also for just sounding nice, and, uh, that's not propaganda, also because it's probably true, at least as a, as a practical matter, because of yeah. 
we suppose that um, there should be no aristocracy. In that uh, sense, uh, either, yes. yes. In uh, that sense, there's no, there's no natural or hierarchy. Or by ballot, yeah. there should be no aristocracy. Yeah. We should all be equal in that regard. If yeah. something is wrong done by, this person is wrong done by anyone. Yeah. That kind of equality yes. can be pushed. Oh yeah, I mean, but I would, I would say these are formal senses of equality uh, uh, that you can get in all kinds of circumstances, not, not substantive and moralised uh, uh, exceptions. Um, I mean, there's something moral about saying there's no hierarchy, you know, everybody's equally entitled to do what they like with their own life, nobody can tell anybody else what to do. Uh, equality is in there, but it's... But, as I said, to, to try and put the, all the stress on the equality... Oh, is, is just, that's just, right. uh, that's, yeah, just... Equality of what? Liberty. Why, why are you putting the stress on the equality? I just can't see why you're going on and on about the equality. It must got to be. The liberty is the thing, isn't it? Yeah, but if it sells, mm. without undermining the philosophy, then push it. Yeah. I mean, no one has a right to act as if they, by one means or the other, by birth, by vote, by popular acclaim, by success in war, by public opinion poll, mm. they are in a position to practically impose upon others. Yeah. But they can do what others may not. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Paul? No, I disagree with that completely. <laughs> Good. Oh, so. Absolutely no, no, no merit to be had in pushing the equality meeting at all. No? No. 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 Uh, because as soon as you uh, the only sense in which it's actually useless to say you know, if, we, if we have maximum possible liberty, that would be with uh, everybody has equality except just the you know, criminals who are being justly punished who wouldn't, uh, wouldn't have liberty, but then it's a separate case. Well, I think that liberty has been equally respected. Uh, yeah, okay, respect. um, but um, but. Uh, <clears throat> To, to say, oh, you know, nobody should, shouldn't have any aristocracy. Like, if, if, um, if, yeah, an enlightened ruler, for instance, yeah, the king of Liechtenstein or the Grand Duke of Liechtenstein, whatever, has quite a lot of power in Liechtenstein. It's not democratic; it's unusual in a Western country. Uh, and he's quite um, libertarian. I believe he's a friend of Hans Hermann Hoppers. He's less illiberal, <laughs> <laughs> but, he's, but he's libertarian anyway. Yeah. But, <laughs> Uh, that's illiberal. Is that the return? Yeah, but the problem is, yeah, that's good, yeah. If you say, oh no, we can't, yeah, we must get rid of, we must purge all our stuff. I'd probably like to talk the other fellow again about reaction libertarianism, because yeah, I thought he did a better job of defending monarchy than Popper did. Yeah. Uh, that chap he spoke a couple of weeks yes, ago. Yeah. And uh, he, he gave better arguments for that. But, uh, yeah, no, in an ideal world, you, you won't, there won't be a king, and there won't be a monarch, there won't be an aristocracy, like that. But in the practical world, it could well be that an aristocracy or a monarch oh. inherited privilege and have helped us get better. You know, even it'd be better to have 650 utterly corrupt MPs instead of all taking graft and actually exercising political power. Even that would be better. So, you know, instead, we got both. Yeah, we have both. Yeah. <laughs> as, a <laughs> bolt, as a bolt hole, yeah. I would bolt to it. Yes. It's not like the choice of evils argument, isn't it? Um, <laughs> I, I know I've come across the, 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 sort of the, the Hobbit and argument, which is that. You know, the, the, the choice between the kind of democ kind of democracy we have at the moment and say a relatively benevolent um, um, monarch, um, although you have to be quite choosy as to what kind of monarchy you you, you, you find, it's not an option can be horrific. Uh, that you, you, the, the monarchy is often that is a far the better choice. And it's interesting that one or two is having these arguments with um, some very Republican minor chap about the run about the time the, the diamond um, jubilee. Mm. And so, actually, you know, frankly, if you're choice between a constitutional powerless but relatively benign monarchy and the kind of stuff that we've seen, may democracies are choosing monarchy every time. Uh, but that may be just a happy accident of, mm. of events and can't necessarily. You're not living in the Belgian Congo. You know? yeah. Yeah. Well, exactly. <laughs> if, you're, if, you're, if you're having a citizen in the time of the late Caesars, I think you'd probably be quite keen to see a return to a republic. But I mean, in terms of the, where it reads to what this can make us say about. Um, Equality stuff. I mean, does he show any awareness about what libertarians of different stripes have got to say about these kind of issues? Because the impression I get is that a lot of this stuff, I mean, it, it just completely goes over his head, and you wouldn't have any idea about what Paul's just talked about. Is that what I mean? I should have brought the book in really so that I can uh, quickly uh, check in the bibliography, but uh, 
uh, and it doesn't have a big bibliography at the end of each chapter, just one at the end. So, Does uh, he draw any of the kind of debate? I mean, Luke Tanks, for example, might do different disagree on things like abortion, disagree on things like death penalty, no, no, well, get well as I said, if I, as I said for him, libertarians defend the free market, the bastards. You don't care about the, all this other stuff. Bah, no, no, because that, that he does that he doesn't sort of think that that's got anything really to do with libertarianism because he he's in favour of that as well. So, so, so he doesn't identify as any mind. inherent. In, there's nothing inherently libertarian about it. He doesn't discuss it. He does, he actually. Footnote 5, he says, there is a difference between a libertarian and a conservative. And it's libertarians believe in things like free drugs. Sorry, you should be able to uh, take drugs and engage in sex. And, uh, so, that, uh, so there is this difference. But there is, in principle, there's this difference between a libertarian right. and a conservative. But, that, but he puts it in the decent obscurity of a footnote. He doesn't want to discuss it. He's not interested in it. So, for example, the fact that libertarians are, say, opposing type of military conscription or...? Nothing. 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 nothing, nothing. No, no, no. It is, an, it is really just... It's an attack on knows it with a bit of flu thrown in. Because uh, just to show he wasn't just knows it, I'm afraid. That's... But, he, uh, I mean, he had a lot of ground to cover because he's, uh, there are an awful lot of... Writers in he's trying to cover the whole of contemporary political philosophy, uh, but then that's what he chose to do. Um, you know, nobody made him say there are no libertarian anarchists. You know, he chose to write that down. He chose to have in his index or bibliography a book by a libertarian anarchist arguing for libertarian anarchy, and then chose to write there are none. So I mean, shoddy scholarship. Well, he doesn't read all the books. He doesn't read all the books. It's probably his research assistant's assistant who put the bibliography together. Yeah, don't know. Well, it's a bit like that one or two others. Sort of, I suppose it's like one of those things. If you, if you read books about something, whether it be a newspaper article or anything else, about a subject you know a lot about, and normally you'll read the article according to the author concerned and nod and think, oh, that's quite an insightful piece. And then one day they'll write about something you I had this experience where I read The Economist magazine. Mm. There's something writing about something I just spend all my day writing about. And I think, oh my God. Because it's, it's done very much on the fly, quick, quite superficial, but it's got a certain sort of knowingness about it. It's very clever, actually, if you take a completely moral view about it. Mm. But when you actually get down to it, it's, there's nothing there. And, um, you know, case. When you had that kind of experience reading so called experts about something that you know a lot about, it's just garbage, then it's quite so. They have, they have um, Paul, they have PP at Oxford. Surely these people know what they're talking about. <laughs> they've taken three degrees, not, 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 three, not three thirds, three separate degrees they've taken. Yeah, amazing. David Cameron's got a PP from Oxford. Oh, that was his death theory. The evidence of the brilliance of that every day, every day of the news. <laughs> No <laughs> first question. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know if you're right, but it, 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 he's the only introduction to principal philosophy that mentions libertarianism. I'm sure I've read others. Well, I, um, I, I and, seem to. Uh, uh, no. I'll have to check on my shelf, but anyway, I think that might be. But certainly, um, there are other. They're few and far between, at yeah, least, because I did might, a good might, survey. It might yeah. be the one that it's, it's an int- general introduction that covers libertarianism. There are other critical books of critical of libertarianism written by left liberal types. Uh, and they just make the same sort of silly mistakes as, mm. as, uh, as Alan Hayworth's anti-libertarianism, yes. which I think you reviewed a while ago. Yeah. Uh, there's another one called Liberalism at Wit's End, uh, who's yes, author, know, which well. I temporarily forget the name of. I think, oh, God. Uh, um, I know what you mean. But they, they all go down the route of just setting up these straw men, you know, mm. that, uh, that they just imagine. Yeah, they, they're just, they spend all the time attacking these libertarians they've invented in their own minds. And John, George Monbiot was at it in The Guardian last year or earlier this year, where he was going with the mouth of the territory. It's the same. Do you remember Rand as well, which I thought was in fact, the stuff which I mean, most sympathise with Rand, but mm. he made classic errors, I mean, really quite bad ones. And it, 
you know, but I suppose the thing is, it's sort of, they make the Cape Nation, they sort of think we're really, you know, George Moon, Bombier in the garden, mm. with the exception of, you know, someone like Tim West and the just a fisky, uh, is that they, they probably lap this up, they just assume that that's, that's the correct picture, and that's it. I mean, that, 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 it's just sort of reading and understanding these people takes a lot of time. They've written big, thick books, and it's just so much. Of course, if you are, really are, uh, if you've got down to their fundamental assumptions, you can usefully do what he's trying to do and say, uh, it seems to follow from these assumptions that this, and, and, uh, and I can add these criticisms or whatever, and, and you actually can be doing some good critical work. It's just that in his case, the things that he thinks that libertarians say, they don't say, and he's, he's, so he's starting from false premises. Well, I mean, one thing also that occurs to me is that um, they probably don't understand socialism either, these people. And I don't know, but I imagine there are probably socialist groups reading Will Kimmick and going, God, look at the crutches effort he makes of attacking socialism. He's absolutely fucking useless. Because, I mean, you only have to be stopped on the street out here by some of these so called Marxists to know that they don't know one end of Marx from their arsehole. Mm. They've they never read it. And you can say, well, what is it, my Marx? And they just, give you, they just give you a diet of greenish political correctness. You your, yeah. Because that's just, it's just the default men, whoever the green political correct people are, but whatever, whoever their insidious masters are, are doing a marvellous job of pumping this guff out into the minds of people. So it's, mm. it's just, yeah, it just seems to be the default awash. Mechanisms, yeah, they're not socialists, they're not red socialists, they don't know anything about that. I well, there are different kinds of socialism, yeah, it's just a greenwash of correctness that you just can be aware. Kimberley are not so particularly green, but he wrote it before the green is really got going, yeah. Um, but it, yeah, it's that kind of genre, you know. Be careful that we're not using too much color prejudice against these people as regards such greenwashing people. At present, it's true to say they won't argue at length for it, because it's a bit tedious and they find it a bit of a burden, and they won't kill for it, which is something to be said. There's a machine washing after half of this, but they will back people who do. Yes, <laughs> yes right. yeah. uh, if there's enough of them, kill for it. Um, as regards straw men, it should be said that sometimes they attack straw men and lose. Yes, yeah. I think, I think he. Uh... He largely won them. Yes, we get the right straw men. Yeah, yeah. Having constructed them. Yes. Because Bernard Levin got a straw man erected, uh, elected, erected. That would be clever. <laughs> <laughs> elected <laughs> at to, uh, the um, uh, London School of Economics. He, he put the name up. It's a straw. Uh, and uh, 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 invented the name uh, yeah, and uh, campaigned on his behalf. And, and when he was elected, he duly wheeled a straw man. Onto the stage, and said, "This is the candidate that's been duly elected." So, uh, yeah, they can win elections. In straw men, yeah. in a straw bubble. Yeah. Is there any uh, contributions? Oh, well, with that, then I suppose we ought to retire. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.